Well, thank you everyone for joining us both online and in person. I'd like to thank our donors for their wonderful support. I'd also like to thank the Gertz Gallery Advisory Board, Parkland College Administration, as well as Donna Gertz for whom the gallery is named and her husband, Fred. We're also appreciative of the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency for their continued support that we received through uh, grant funding. It also allows us to do events like these that are free and open to the public. I'd also like to thank Paula McCarty for all of her help as the exhibitions coordinator. She's magnificent and I couldn't do it without her. Tonight we have Maureen Watecha, Waticha, Waticha, that's right, uh, helping in the technology area as Cindy Smith wasn't available tonight. So thank you very much. Uh, Gertz Gallery serves as a platform to exhibit contemporary art. We are a learning laboratory for our students and it is critical that we exhibit and host programming that features professional artists so that faculty can use the gallery as an instructional resource and our students and the community can experience the artwork in person and hear artists speak about their process, their career and their artistic journey. Tonight, of course, we are honored to have Jeanette May here with us virtually to speak about her photography that is in the exhibition. In addition to some of her earlier work, she is a photo-based artist using critical, sometimes playful approach to investigating representation. Early training as a painter is evident in her carefully arranged compositions and rich color palette. May's photographs are constructed, staged, lit, and carefully considered. Her recent still life projects embrace technology, design, and obsolescence. May received her MFA in photography from Cal Arts and her BFA in painting from the University of Illinois here in Urbana-Champaign. She has also been awarded grants, fellowships, and residencies from the NEA Regional Artist Project Fund, Brooklyn Arts Council, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the Illinois Arts Council, Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs, Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, and Ms. Foundation. She was a part of the nonprofit studio program called Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. And I think she'll mention that a little bit in her talk. Her work is exhibited in galleries and museums internationally, including New York City, Washington, DC, Chicago, Los Angeles, Toronto, Milan, Athens, Barcelona, and Shanghai. Jeanette lives in Brooklyn, New York. So let's give Jeanette a warm welcome and a warm um, I'm going to first thank Lisa uh, for inviting me to be a part of the exhibition and to give a talk tonight. Um, I'm going to discuss several of my photography projects starting in 2008. I've been making art for much longer, of course. Uh, I will do my best to explain the commonalities from one of my projects to another. At a glance, it might be hard to understand how one person made these varied photographs. All of my photographs are planned and staged. I don't wander around with my camera looking for something to photograph. As Lisa mentioned, I studied painting as an undergrad at the University of Illinois, and I just happened to enroll in a photography class. I fell in love with photography, but I still work like a painter. I say, I think like a painter. I have a concern or an interest that I want to explore, and then I think about how to express it visually. My images may reference historical paintings, contemporary advertising imagery, or cinematic narratives. I will begin here with the cinematic narratives that I created in 2008 while living in Washington, DC. Each photo in this series is paired with a text from a novel. I'm going to start by reading part of the text for Janie from Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. He set it up and began to show her and she found herself glowing inside. Somebody wanted her to play. Somebody thought it natural for her to play. That was even nice. She looked him over and got little thrills from every one of his good points. Those lazy full eyes with the lashes curling sharply away like drawn scimitars. The lean over padded shoulders and narrow waist, even nice. For the photo students in the audience, I want to mention that I was using strobe lights and a long exposure to capture the bar's lighting in this scene. Easy on the Eyes examines how women have been able to look at men within the confines of Western visual and textual narratives. I consider the female gaze via the genre of directorial photography. 
These carefully staged photographs utilize a cinematic look and implied narrative. Unlike most work in this vein, which focuses on young female subjects, here the camera surveys desirable men. I juxtapose a visual narrative against a passage from a novel by a prominent female author describing a male character. Once text accompanies these photographs, the visual narrative is no longer entirely open. The pairing creates neither irony nor parody, but rather a disruption of the viewer's desire for an uncomplicated tale. The implied narrative is misdirected by an image and text combination that both produces and questions meaning. Each scene includes a male character depicted in mid storyline and an implied woman somewhere just outside the frame. She is not visible, but we do see her cast off shoes, dropped gloves, or other clues. In fact, her role in the narrative may be more significant than his. Where has she gone? What game is she playing? Why does she need three passports? He is the photograph's subject matter, but she is the narrative's protagonist. Until recently, we rarely found images of attractive men created for a female viewer. I specify a female viewer because there is a much longer history of homosexual imagery for a male viewer. If anyone is interested in the topic of the female gaze, you should read the uh, film critic Laura Mulvey's essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, even though it is from way back in 1975, it really set the standard for this discussion. In contrast, the novel provides a longer history of offering male bodies to a female reader, including detailed descriptions of women finding pleasure in gazing at beautiful men. This photo is paired with Jane Austen's Emma. She describes Mr. Knightley. He could not have appeared to greater advantage perhaps anywhere than where he had placed himself. His tall, firm, upright figure among the bulky forms and stooping shoulders of the elderly men was such as Emma felt must draw everybody's eyes. And excepting her own partner, there was not one among the whole row of young men who could be compared with him. He moved a step, a few steps nearer, and those few steps were enough to prove in how gentlemanlike a manner, with what natural grace he must have danced, would he but take the trouble. I titled each of the photographs for the woman protagonist in the quoted text. I read a lot of novels while working on this series. That, that was my research. Um, I pulled out text as I was reading that I thought would be useful, descriptions of men by female characters, but I did not create photographs for a particular text or look for specific text to match with the photos. I really worked on both of those things simultaneously, but separately because I didn't want the images to illustrate the text. I always found a connection in the text image combination. It, it isn't random, but also, again, really important image, not illustrating the text. I should talk a bit about how I took the photos. I, I know there are some photo students in the room. <clears throat> so I would think of a scene, cinematic narrative, what would he be doing? Uh, how would she be implied? Then I looked for a man to be the model and a location. Um, this happens to have been my front porch in Alexandria, Virginia, where we lived when I started the project. Um, I occasionally shot with daylight or fill flash, but mostly with strobes. I usually have one or two assistants, which makes me sound very glamorous, but uh, it, <laughs> it was not. And, um, and this photo was particularly fun, though tricky, because we were combining strobes with a long exposure so that the jack-o'-lanterns would actually show up as glowing. They were not photoshopped, just a long exposure. He took a deep breath, and we all hoped it would work. Um, although that is the beauty of shooting digital, you know it worked when you got it. I found this beautiful tailor shop in Georgetown, Washington, DC, and the owner was very kind to let me use it. When I started this series, I photographed the attractive men that I already knew. 
And then I started looking for men, which can be awkward when you're a woman then in my 40s and in a long-term relationship. Fortunately, my partner, David, is very supportive of my art career. Um, I found this model while we were waiting in line for popcorn at a movie theater. But my favorite example of finding a model is when we were dancing in a club on New Year's Eve and I told David, I'll be right back. I have to go give my business card to that cute guy over there. When approaching potential models, I always explain what I wanted from them, that they would be an object of desire for a female viewer. I also give my models what I call veto rights. After a photo shoot, I edit down to two or three images that I prefer and then give the model the right to reject or veto any photo they would not want the world to see. I don't let them choose the photo that will be used because it is my project. So I keep that power, but I don't want to embarrass anyone either. And, and none of the men did um, like pull out of the project. So everybody I think was happy in the end. Bachelor pads furthered my investigation into the representation of desirable men and the development of the female gaze in contemporary visual culture. I began researching bachelor pads after attending a lecture by an interior design historian on the invention of the bachelor pad. I mean, I had never really thought of the bachelor pad as something that started at a particular time under certain circumstances, but it was like post-World War II. By the way, these photos are named for the man in the photo and the numbers are not a ranking, just the order in which the photo was created. So bachelor number one is Matt. Inspired by 1960s movies and magazine spreads highlighting the phenomenon of the bachelor pad, I staged the contemporary bachelor in his metropolitan dwelling. The original bachelor pads were conspicuously heterosexual and masculine in design, filled with the latest gadgets and signifiers of hedonistic pleasure. In my photographs, I explored whether the bachelor pad had evolved or if one would still find a stereo system or a pool table. The pad may define one's economic or cultural standing, provide refuge, or seduce potential lovers. My images raise these issues while offering a voyeuristic peek into the private living space of single men. There were several men in the rugby club living in this house. This photo was taken in Washington, D.C., though most were shot in New York City. Many view viewers comment on how clean the bachelor pads look, and I remind them that the guys knew we were coming. However, this bachelor pad did need a little cleaning up. Uh, we left some of the mess. There's beer cans and other things on top of their homemade bar, and there's um, some other debris just kind of stuffed behind the bar, but still showing enough for you to see it. I, for this project, defined bachelors as unmarried men who did not live with their parents, spouses, or lovers. The bachelors identify as straight or gay, they live alone or with roommates, and cover a range of ages and socioeconomic groups. I discovered some commonalities in bachelor pad decor. The color brown, I think men are afraid of color. Uh, large screen uh, TVs, um, although not always in my photographs since they're really not very interesting to look at when they're not turned on and guitars, many, many guitars. I mentioned this to one of the bachelors I photographed later on in the project and teased him about not having a guitar. And then he confessed that he had one in his closet. I posed the men in a formal manner. The photographs are located somewhere between portraiture and documentary. I approached it like an editorial magazine spread on the contemporary bachelor pad. The men aren't models or actors, and most were a little uncomfortable being photographed. And I posed them, sit here, put your hand there, look this direction, which made them even more stiff and uncomfortable. It wasn't my intention to make them uncomfortable, but I realized that it actually worked for me. The, there was one guy I photographed who was totally at ease the whole time. If they were at ease and poised and confident in the photo, then they appeared to possess all the power. 
Their gaze is never towards the camera, which is also true in the earlier Easy on the Eyes series, but they seem self-consciously aware of being looked at. Looking at the camera would be an exchange of gazes. The man pictured and the viewer would be gazing at each other, equal in power. But having the model look at the, not look at the camera, not catch us looking, allows women and men to stare unabashedly at attractive bachelors and then visually rifle through their belongings. Again, note the guitars. Notice the bar he's leaning on. Now that could have been in a 1960s bachelor pad. Some of you are now thinking, how did I find the bachelors? No, I did not place an ad online. I can't imagine who would respond to that. I found the men through friends and colleagues, and it turns out the bachelors know other bachelors. I exhibited them as 24 by 36 inch prints, which is a scale that enables you to read the spines of the books on the shelves or covet a particularly desirable apartment. There's something about New Yorkers too. We are all obsessed with seeing other people's apartments. Um, this is a particularly desirable apartment in the West Village of New York City. I wanted a socioeconomic range of apartments. This is a bit more modest than the last one. Um, the, again, the bachelors all had veto rights, just as an easy on the eyes. I always met the men and viewed their homes before the photo session was scheduled. I started this project soon after moving to New York City, and that made it extra challenging because apartments are small in New York. <clears throat> I actually ended up rejecting some bachelors because their apartments were just too small to photograph in. I was, you know, in them thinking, where am I going to put the camera, the lights, the assistant, myself? There's no way we're going to be able to do this. And in a few cases, the apartment was really too run down. This apartment is a typically small New York City apartment, but it was full of amenities and in a really great neighborhood and brown. When I met this bachelor, Brian, I saw his apartment and I almost didn't photograph him because it was so impersonal. I remember that he had um, just moved in and he promised that he would hang some art on the walls before I came back to take the photos. But then when I got there, there was no art on the walls. And later on, I met another woman photographer that had photographed immigrant men in their bachelor apartments and the emptiness and lack of personal touches was part of her theme. So this represents one common version of the bachelor pad. I hope my bachelor pad series is engaging and raises a few questions beyond what does the modern bachelor pad look like? Um, what do we learn about these specific bachelors? How do we, how do men present themselves to the camera? And, and does the female viewer take pleasure in looking? This might seem like a leap from photographing men and exploring the female gaze to photographs of pet toys as murder victims. However, I'm still arranging bodies in an environment there's implied narrative and cinematic staging. And there was a feminist concern at the start of my morbidity and mortality series. Morbidity and mortality, I say, is my lighthearted and fluffy response to the popular fascination with depictions of crime scenes, murder, and forensics. Let me be clear, these photographs are meant to be humorous, even though my inspiration was serious. Contemporary films and forensic themed television programs reveal an obsession with corpses, specifically the artfully composed images of dead bodies, very often women's bodies. This is true in art and photography too. It's an ancient macabre pastime staging the dead. For example, the geometric stacks of skulls and catacombs, paintings of operating theaters, and 19th century dioramas of taxidermied animals. While death and memento mori are perennial motifs in art, contemporary U.S. culture is awash in carefully arranged and creatively oft stiffs. As an artist examining this trend, I face the challenge of depicting yet not reproducing this violence. That is the real challenge, how to examine the depiction of violence or murder without simply reproducing it. 
And for me, the answer was pet toys. <clears throat> In my staged photographs of recently discovered victims, the body is that of a dead pet toy. The small furry object lying on the floor, for example, is a dismembered bird's head, a cat toy. I find a perverse quality in pet toys that resemble real animals, already deceased or clearly marked for death. All of the pet toys used in this series are straight out of the package. They were already creepy when I bought them. For example, many bird-shaped toys for dogs like this pheasant have a rope neck so that the dog can flip it around like the broken neck of a real pheasant. To create these photographs, I spent a certain amount of time looking for models. I could not walk past a pet store without running in to see if there was a good toy in there and scouting locations, just like my photographs of men. I thought about the cinematic aspect, where is the body found in murder mysteries? This only subtly, um, this one subtly re references the 1950s film noir classic Sunset Boulevard, though bodies continue to turn up in contemporary swimming pools. This one is called Deer, though actually it, the package was labeled Fawn, um, and it might suggest the scene in the movie Fargo. One of the aspects of contemporary crime programs that I found disturbing was the beautiful staging of the murder. Even if it was supposed to be a seedy hotel room, you know, the wallpaper and the bedspread were actually quite lovely. The lighting would be a subtle blue tone and maybe there was no blood on the body. This isn't always true in all the crime programs. Of course, some of the forensic based programs are quite gory. I photographed this dog toy in Central Park because sometimes the body is found in the woods. It's pretty hard to get raised eyebrows in New York City. Like people really are not, you know, surprised by anything. But if you take a lawn rake onto the subway, you will get a few looks. This fish is a cat toy, though as a cat owner, it seems very impractical. Um, this is my version of the body found in the dumpster. It is also the most obvious connection to my next series, Tech Vanitas. Before we move on to tech mortality, I would like to show documentation of this work exhibited. Uh, it was shown in OK Harris Gallery in New York City. The gallery doesn't exist anymore though it had been around for a long, long time. Uh, the images are printed two by three feet, so the pet toys are bigger than life size. And after the series was done, I was contacted by Barbara Magazine, which is published in Germany. Um, Barbara is a woman named Barbara Schoenberger, who is a comic actress. And the magazine's tagline is not your ordinary women's magazine. And there is a lot of humor in the magazine. So they reproduced my photographs in an issue with a crime theme. And they added a narrative to each photo describing the crime as they imagined it. Okay, continuing with the death theme. I'm gonna to read to you the text that I have on this art history portion of our program. <clears throat> According to the Tate Museum, this still life painting of musical instruments, wine and jewels represents the fleeting pleasures of life. While the skull, which you can barely see up here in the upper left, um, and the hourglass, which I think is over here somewhere, um, symbolize the inevitability of death. The open book shows a brief poem emphasizing the theme of mortality. The Latin inscription in the top left corner comes from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And this is why such pictures are known as vanitas paintings. The definition and the vanitas label were applied to 17th century Dutch still lifes by art historians, not by the painters themselves. Recent art historians such as Svetlana Elpers and Norman Bryson have asserted that these painting, uh, painters were not moralizing and there is no hidden underlying message. Rather, the still life paintings displayed material wealth, international trade, love of culture, craft and science, and skilled painting. 
Vanitas paintings celebrate the new wealth of the Netherlands in the 17th century. Their still lives recorded the affluence of finely crafted domestic merchandise, silk, porcelain, Venetian glass, silver goblets, food, and flowers. I'm showing examples of 17th century Dutch Vanitas paintings because this is a historical reference that not everyone is familiar with. Although my photographs are not copies of any specific Vanitas paintings, it's important to see them as they are a reference for my work. The inspiration for the Tech Vanitas series came from several directions. My undergraduate degree in painting, which informs my interest in still lifes and working method of staging photographs. I love beautifully designed objects. I teach digital photography and thus I feel a pressure to keep up with camera technology and Adobe upgrades. And I relocate too often. Each time we pack up our belongings, decisions must be made about what to purge, right? The three obsolete computers in the basement, the boom box that eats your tapes, the tapes. So I was thinking about obsolescence. We live in an age filled with devices that make domestic life faster, smarter, easier, and more complicated. Consumers may choose from an astounding number of tech products. Items fill our shopping carts and our homes. The more we yearn to keep current, the newest phone, computer, camera, audio system, espresso maker, the more we produce, consume, and discard. Cutting edge technology becomes outdated, embarrassing, collectible, antiquated, and forgotten. I arranged gadgets from different time periods in each of the still lifes. So this still life isn't like the 1950s still life. There's always a range from antique or as antique as I can get with technology and something as new as I can find. The juxtaposition of old and new suggests that passing of time of course, the latest cutting edge technology might be outdated by the time I finish the still life. Contemporary still lifes exist in the form of advertising imagery. The newest gadget is carefully styled and photographed to convince potential owners of technological ascension. My Tech Vanitas photographs reference both 17th century still lifes and contemporary advertising imagery. I began with vertical compositions and stacked the objects precariously to add an element of anxiety. I needed some kind of organizational structure for the series to avoid simply making random piles of junk. So I determined that certain categories of domestic commonplace technology would be represented in each still life. Items not fitting the categories are also included sometimes, but these five elements are key. Optics, audio, time, communication, light. Draped, folded, or creased fabric is also a reference to Vanitas paintings. The Dutch painters were in competition with the craft guild members trying to prove that it took more skill to paint a goblet or textile than to handcraft the object itself. The Dutch paintings are also very detailed, part of showing off their skills. So I photographed my still lifes with the aperture at F16 or F20 to guarantee good depth of field, crisp, sharp focus on all the props. I started this series by assembling still lifes uh, from items I already owned. Um, in this example, the clock belonged to my grandmother and somehow got handed down to me. Most photographers collect vintage cameras and maybe even flash cubes. I have borrowed other items from friends, rented many from an electronics recycling center in Brooklyn, and occasionally purchased things at flea markets and antique stores. I really tried not to buy props, but it happens. And now, of course, I'm trying to, you know, rehome them, sometimes selling them, sometimes taking them to thrift stores. One day I showed up at my studio and there was a bag of random cords left outside my door by a friend who was contributing to my tech project. And I thought, great, just what I need, more cords. But it made me think about cords and power sources and, and how there are important aspects of the changing technology, electronics and obsolescence. 
I usually construct the still lives in my studio, which until very recently was at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Um, I start selecting items from this ever-changing pile, and I check my list of requirements, you know, optics, audio, et cetera. I think about shape, scale, color. Color can be a problem with tech. In this still life, all the items are black or white. I mean, literally, I'll pull out whatever I've got around at that time and put them on the table and look at them and go, darn, there is absolutely no color in any of these. So that's when fabric uh, can add color and you know patterns, um, soften things up a bit. When I think the props are arranged well, then I start to work on the lighting. I use a combination of strobe lights and long exposures to capture the lamp or other illuminated items that are in the scene. If there's a television, like in this one, I time the exposure to capture the desired quality of static on the screen. Most of my exposures, and I'm, I'm talking this talk for the photo students in the room, uh, most of my exposures are between half a second and four seconds. But remember, strobe lights are really doing most of the work. Since I call this series Tech Vanitas, it seemed that I should eventually include a skull. My partner David bought me a cell phone case while I was working on this that had a fabulous skull design on it. So um, I hope that you can see it is. So here's my cell phone and there's the skull reflected in the Wi-Fi router. Uh, I wanted it to be subtle. And um, the, the um, 17th century Dutch painters actually used reflections a lot in their work, both, you know, mostly again, to show off their skills. Um, so shiny surfaces, hard to paint and reflective. Eventually I decided to shift to a horizontal format and create the sense of anxiety, not by stacking, but a disheveled tumbling like the Vanitas paintings called banquets. The banquets paintings are not really about social gatherings, um, even if they relate to food. According to Norman Bryson in his book, Looking at the Overlooked, the objects represented um, form a collection. So a cabinet of curiosities. Bryson states, the collector's items themselves come from a new and greater space of trade routes and colonies, maps and discoveries, investments and capital. This is the still life of mine that probably most closely resembles one of the, the Dutch paintings. And you can see that I even managed to peel a lemon in the style that they did. Bryson's chapter on abundance in the Netherlands was perhaps most relevant to our current situation. We suffer from abundance. Most of us in the US have a lot of stuff. We accumulate stuff for many reasons. In some cases, because we love it, we keep it long after it's broken or obsolete because it's beautiful, charming, or has a sentimental value to us. I feel the need to add that I want my still lives to be delightful, engaging, charming. There's a disco ball. There's also an early computer printer for those of you too young to remember dot matrix printers and a hot pot full of cell phones sent to me by a friend cleaning out her attic. She discovered that they had never gotten rid of any of their cell phones and they sent me like a dozen and several newish gadgets that might be unfamiliar and may already be obsolete. I tried to avoid thematic still lifes. I didn't want them to seem gimmicky, but this one does intentionally have a futuristic sci-fi aspect to it. Fiber optics light, virtual reality goggles, an Amazon Echo, and sticking out of the DVD player is the movie Gattaca. I rented this gramophone and the wax cylinder recording it plays. Behind that is an external five inch floppy disk reader and some floppy disks laid to the right under the Viewmaster. Sometimes I buy new tech for a still life and then I return it to the big box store where I got it. For instance, the crazy expensive juicer in this photograph that looks like R2D2, I think. Um, I almost kept the jar of fireflies. It was so amazing. It's for a baby's nursery. The fireflies blink on and off and it plays lullabies and it's also Bluetooth connected. 
The player piano in the title is implied by the rolls of music on top of the television, those paper rolls. The rolls of paper are perforated, allowing a play, player piano to read the music on them. My grandparents had a player piano, so I know basically how they work. But I looked it up on Wikipedia to, to figure out what exactly you called those things. And it referred to the paper roll as a music storage medium, which I thought was hilarious. Um, it is, however, much like early computer punch cards. And speaking of obsolete storage medium, the VHS tape under the lamp is a copy of Chris Marker's movie, La Jate. And I'm telling you these things because they're all important. <laughs> like I'm picking a particular videotape or a particular DVD. When I started this series, I kept a list of tech that I wanted to have in the photos and a Polaroid SX-70 camera was on my must have items list. And it took me a long time to find one that I could finally afford because they're collectible. Unfortunately, somebody has started you know, remaking um, Polaroid film. So I was able to actually take a few photographs. There are several interesting items in this photo. Harman Kardon speakers, a Luma telecom video phone from the 1980s, which is what this rather unattractive item is here, but it works. Look, there's a blue screen. Um, it predates Skype or Amazon Echo, although it works pretty similar in that both people had to have one of those gadgets in order to video call with each other. There's uh, an Elvis Presley 8 track tape and quite possibly the first Apple camera, who knew Apple made cameras. I know I'm getting distracted by the gadgets, um, I do, but I am an artist and trying to make an aesthetically pleasing still life out of this pile of junk was challenging. There was a real lack of color, but a lot of interesting shapes and textures. There's a pattern of circles, the fan blades repeated in the movie reel. Part of my time is spent finding the tech props and the rest is creating a well-composed, beautifully lit still life. Another one of the thematic still lifes is based on toys. Not all children's toys, however, there are a few adult toys like the espresso machine. I could claim the Guitar Hero is a connection back to my Bachelor Pad series, but that would be pushing it. Um, you may remember me saying that light was one of the five elements of technology that I present in each still life. It doesn't have to be a lamp, but um, it's sometimes something that's light emitting. So in this case, it's the illuminated passenger car in the train set. The Tech Vanitas series has been exhibited quite a few times, um, including a solo show in Shanghai and this exhibit at Klumpshin Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. And I was very fortunate to be invited to present my photographs in the, the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority Lightbox Project in New York City. So they were on view there in the subway station at Bryant Park, 42nd Street. This is the perfect medium for these photographs because light boxes are normally used for advertising in public spaces. I'm sure subway readers, uh, riders were momentarily confused trying to decide what my photographs were trying to sell them. The photographs were installed in January of 2020. Yes, right before the pandemic. Uh, they were up for over a year. Um, the photos were about four by six feet tall, not quite that big, but almost um, film transparencies on these, you know, illuminated backlit boxes. So Curious Devices follows closely on the heels of Tech Vanitas, and, and there's a few pieces from both of these projects in the exhibit there. Um, as I was completing the last few Tech Vanitas still lives, I began thinking more about how gadgets work and repairing broken tech. My brother is an electrical engineer and he was taking apart every gadget in our home since he could hold a screwdriver. He was curious. He could fix anything by the age of six. I don't have half his curiosity, but I managed to fix some things and I am a devoted recycler reuser. So I wanted to open up this vintage radio and see how the vacuum tube heated up before the radio started to play. This series of still life references both the Vanitas paintings and cabinets of curiosities. And 
new or old item of technology is open in each of them to investigate. The light element is a little more prominent than before and, and is usually pointing at the thing that has been taken apart or broken. In order to keep the Vanitas sense of luxury and finely crafted merchandise, I've added silk fabrics and damask wallpapers in this series, which also helps avoid looking like an illustration for a repair manual. As I mentioned, I use strobe lights and shoot, uh, if you care, with a Canon 5D Mark IV. I spend a lot of time on the composition and then the lighting. The whole process takes days, sometimes weeks. I also print my own images on an Epson professional printer and cotton rag inkjet paper. I'm including the same five categories of tech, optics, audio, time, communication, light, but I've added an element which is tools. Each still life includes a tool, the small pliers on top of the radio here, it may not be the right tool for the job, but it suggests that a repair is desired. I have a number of tools, but now I find myself going into hardware stores and asking if they have anything about so big and green. The broken or open tech may be old and obsolete or quite new, like the Apple Watch. I've allowed myself to indulge in more beauty in the Curious Devices series. I'm a little more selective about the aesthetic quality of the tech. I don't feel like, oh, I have to have that in here, even though it's incredibly ugly, just because you know it must be represented. Um, I feel like I've represented everything I needed to. This one, um, this pile of junk ended up together because they were, they were all um, saturated color. They were all a little too intense and plasticky and they couldn't go with anything else. So I put them all together in one. The DVD next to the broken DVD player is Jacques Tati's Playtime. The photo on the right includes a vintage roll top radio, which I think is amazing. And the most beautiful light meter I've ever seen, which I bought in an antique store and a Kodak disc camera from around 1980. Maybe there are a couple of people in the audience who know that. This is the last still life in the Curious Devices series. I have created a few more still lifes for a commission and a print edition through F22 Prints in Chicago, but I am currently exploring new ideas, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen next. So I'm going to end my presentation here. Um, someone asks, what exactly is strobe light? Um, strobe light is like a flash, right? But bigger in a studio, big, you know, think about those fashion shoots with the bright lights going off. So they're very fast, electronic, larger flash. Okay. And um, could you repeat, here's somebody who's a techie. Could you repeat the name of the printer that you use? Oh, I have an Epson Shure Color P7000, I think, if you really want to know. So it's a, it's a big, large format professional Epson printer. So I can print 24 inches wide. So I can print my own photographs. And I used to always print at whatever college I was teaching at. That was one of the fringe benefits of being an adjunct faculty member. Um, but in New York, I've been teaching at the International Center of Photography, usually called ICP. And a few, a couple of years ago, while I was in the middle of the Tech Vanitas project and had been printing some of them already, ICP decided to switch over from Epson printers to Canon printers. And I almost had a heart attack. And then I said, but wait, wait, what are you gonna do with the Epson printers? So they sold me one of the old ones, yay. So now I have my own and can print anytime I want in my studio. Great, thank you. Any questions from the audience here? Um, oh, we've got a, pe a question from Peg Shaw. Um, going back to your early series when you're photographing men, it sounds, I think at the beginning you said, oh, I know a lot of these men, but then eventually it, it went into men you don't know, but you make contact with them. And I specifically thought about it during the Bachelor series, because is there ever a time where it just didn't work? 
like I think that interacting with these men that you don't know and you're saying you're posing them and telling them where to look, was there ever a time? Well, let me ask it two ways. Was there ever a time where they told you what they got out of the experience and it was really sort of a positive thing for them? Or, and, or was there a time where it just didn't work with that person for whatever reason? Um, well, oddly, the one time where it didn't work was when he was way too comfortable. Like he just, he was just kind of reclining and looking totally in control of the whole situation. And every time I would say, um, I would say, stop, hold it for a second, you know, cause I was going to like go up and, you know, straighten his collar or something. He would grab his phone and start checking his email. And, and what I meant was freeze, do not move. I've got you in exactly the right position. So that photo shoot didn't, didn't work out well at all, unfortunately. Um, in other cases, because I had met them beforehand and and I had another person in the room too, which I think helped a lot to have an, an assistant. I mean, partly it was because I would send her over to adjust the collar. So I, I wasn't jumping out from behind the camera all the time. But so that um, made it a little easier than I think if it was just me and the guy. Um, and, you know, some of the guys really like loved the photograph afterwards. I, I always also told them that they could have one of the photographs, um, actually not even necessarily the one that I chose that I was happy to print a different one for them, or I could do a headshot portrait session just, you know, for them. And a few of them did that. So, um, you know, nobody seemed unhappy afterwards, even though they weren't always happy, you know, like my choice of photograph wasn't always their favorite photograph, but they had different reasons for choosing a photograph, you know, where they thought they, first of all, looked happy, right? So none of the men are smiling. And, and I've had people tell me they, they all look like unhappy bachelors. <laughs> um, <laughs> that wasn't really my point either. But uh, if you look, like I kept looking at like GQ magazine, men's kind of fashion magazines and how the men posed and and they weren't generally smiling either. And, and the really easygoing guy, when he would smile and, and pose and be totally in control of the situation, he looked like he was in like a Sears catalog. It was a totally different look. I think that it's really interesting because these students have not gotten to their portrait photographing people assignment yet, but it's very tricky that that psychological sort of relationship you have with them and like, when you said, oh, sometimes it doesn't work out because the apartment was just too grubby or something. And I think, ooh, how did you deal with that? Where you're like, oh, sorry, uh, this isn't gonna work. So after dealing with all those people, working with these objects must have just been <laughs> so, so it was a nice break. I guess. <laughs> it was. I mean, then I went to the pet toys, right? And I'm like, okay, I can just take this toy wherever I want yeah. and put it in the scene and <laughs> bend <laughs> it. And <laughs> yeah, I was wondering um, also about the Bachelor series. Some of the men were barefoot and some of them had shoes. Was that something that you asked them to do? And if they were comfortable, they would do it or they were they already barefoot? Or was some of them just like, you know, what was the situation with that? <laughs> yeah, well, we were in their home, so it probably had something to do with, you know, how they were walking around their own apartment. Um, and also like how they were dressed, like some were really casual in jeans and others were a little more dressed up. I did, I did um, tell them to think about what they were going to wear and to have maybe a couple of outfits available. Um, so I tried to avoid like really bold patterns. I think there's only one person in a plaid shirt in the whole thing. And a lot of the guys had plaid and, and I kind of poo-pooed it. Um, and, uh, you know, so they, I wanted them to feel comfortable in whatever they were wearing and kind of maybe sexy, um, you know, it was about desire, being an object of desire. And then it had a little bit to do with whether, you know, whether their feet were up on the couch or not, then maybe they would not have any socks or shoes on. So um, at, I don't remember entirely, but it was a little bit of a, a discussion between us how it went. And, and I'll also tell you something else. Um, so when I was doing this, that project, I was and I don't know, my late forties, early fifties. And, and some of the guys were like 22, right? So I started carefully picking who my lighting assistant would be 
to to have kind of the right vibe in the room. And if it was a heterosexual guy in his early 20s, I would bring a young woman as my lighting assistant. And I have a lot of women lighting assistants anyway, but I felt like that kind of um, made the guys a little more comfortable, like reclining on the couch for the camera. If there was someone in the room that they felt more like them in some way, I was maybe more like their mom. Okay, I have another question. <laughs> in the um, the dead animal toy series, specifically the fish cat toy, did you dump over a trash can or did you arrange the trash for that? <laughs> oh yeah, I totally arranged the trash. <laughs> Everything is arranged. There are no accidents in my photographs. <laughs> I arranged the leaves in Central Park for that photograph. Okay. <laughs> I actually did some raking first. It's interesting to me because I love Cabinet of Curiosity and the idea of that. And I hadn't put that together in your work. I mean, I really saw the Vanitas connection, but it's very interesting. Now I have to go back and look at the work in the gallery. And um, yeah, because that's such a fascinating concept, that idea of collecting and almost like curating your collection, which in a way with your still lives, you're, you're doing that. I mean, you're kind of the curator of your objects. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really fascinating to hear about how you found the work and how, you know, the different objects or people gave them to you, but how you selected them too. Um, so I really like that about your talk. Um, Denise Seif said, uh, nice addition of the skull in your image. Very nice. Almost a hint of Hans Holbein. So I thought that was nice. She teaches art history here as well uh -huh. as Will Smith thing. Um, someone asked, uh, someone else said, I love your sense of color and the reference to Dutch Fanny Taas. And someone's asking any contemporary artists that influence your work. Yes. Um, actually, before I started making these still lives, I was um, I was really in love with Laura Latinsky's still lives. And uh, she teaches at, I believe, the University of Illinois Chicago campus. Um, and she's represented by a gallery in New York. I don't know where I saw her works first, possibly there. But she was doing these very simple still lives that referenced the Dutch Vanitas. Um, they would be like a dinner table with a plate with a couple of like cherry stems and seeds on it and a kind of stain on the tablecloth and maybe a glass of wine somewhere. And, and they were really elegant and um, surprising and charming. And so those were in the back of my mind for a while. Um, and, you know, and still life is a common topic. It's not like I, I ripped off Laura Latinsky. Like we were all ripping off. I don't know. I think there were artists in Pompeii who were doing still lives when I looked into the history of it. So it's a genre, but I was really admiring her work at the time. And there, there are lots of other photographers whose, whose work I enjoy and, and keep track of them and follow on Instagram. Great. Um, someone else said, uh, oh, Denise Seif says, the collection of wallpaper is also great. Where did you find that? <laughs> yeah, I'm in love with wallpaper now. Um, I, so so my, my earlier studio was in the garment district in New York. So I could very easily walk down the street and get another piece of fabric for my still life if I decided none of the colors I had were any good. Um, and then I realized that there were also places, home decor places that had wallpaper. But wallpaper is freakishly expensive and you have to buy it in packages of two. And I didn't need two rolls of wallpaper for you know $150. I was just trying to do this four by six foot space. Um, and fortunately, I have a good friend who said, look on eBay and Etsy. And so that's where I started finding where you could get maybe just one roll of wallpaper and maybe it was only $20. And um, there was a, a place I found on Etsy, I think, who must have bought out an old, like a paint and hardware store. I think that's who used to carry wallpaper in, in my hometown. So they had all of these old vintage rolls of wallpaper. So I bought several from them. And there are a couple of companies now that are making print on demand wallpaper. So some of these 
wallpapers I have really strongly reference, if not totally rip off William Morris patterns. And, and I would contact them and order like, they would sell you either like a square foot or a certain number of inches in a roll. And then you'd have to wait for them to print it and send it to you. And most of this series I did during the pandemic. So I was, I was actually having, um, you know, sourcing problems. I couldn't go out and just start looking at antique stores and things I was ordering online were taking forever to get there because the post office was working so slowly. So everything really changed in, in my production during the pandemic, but I, I continued to order wallpaper and pray that it would arrive soon. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, so the Veritas and the other tech portraits, um, I know that they look kind of vintage just because they have vintage objects in them, but the photos they themselves seem to have like a vintage um, coloring to them. And I think that's, I was wondering if that was a part of your editing process to intentionally make them look like that. No, actually, no. I, I try to make the colors look all quite realistic to the object because, because you were right in the first place, the, the color of the objects is um, really specific to a time period. So for instance, there's the green rice cooker that's full of the cell phones. Um, and that that is a particular green that's kind of a 1950s, 1960s green. It's not the avocado green of the 70s crock pot. So so the vintage look that comes through is really because of all of the objects, maybe a little bit because of the fabrics, but I'm picking the fabrics. And sometimes really I'm like half setting up the still life. Um, and then I'm like pulling out fabric and kind of laying it next to it and going, oh, none of these are right. I need something that's not quite as saturated or a little bit more of a blue green or whatever it is. And I go looking for that color. So it might be that I'm gearing my color choices also towards the, the vintage but I'm not doing anything like with filters or something to kind of make it all look old fashioned. Thank you. Any last questions? Oh, Peg Shaw's got one. Um, I follow you on Instagram. That's sort of how we thank you. That. Um, so I know, you, or at least I think you recently have a new studio, right? A big, huge, beautiful studio. I was telling my students I'm envious. Um, and you also mentioned in your talk how you move around a lot and then you have to get rid of things and then you acquire things. And so I'm just wondering when you move to a, a new studio and you're doing these setups, how that might change your work. If all of a sudden you have more space or you have more light or you have more storage room. Yeah, I, I mean, when I started at the Elizabeth Foundation, I actually had a smaller studio. And then one of my good friends there said she was moving out. And I said, no, 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 wait. Oh, wait, how big is your studio? Wait, let me get my tape measure. I'll be right over. And, and I moved into her studio when she moved out. And so then I really had more space. And it did affect the still lives because the space I had initially was really narrow. And I would, I would set up the table and the lights, and then I would be up against the wall with the camera trying to get back far enough. So the new space then got me that distance I needed. Um, and this space is a little bit bigger than the last one, but mostly it meant I didn't have to try to get rid of a bunch of stuff before I moved in here because I knew I had more space for storing it. And I guess I could do bigger still lives now. Um, my partner, David, jokes about how, well, so he's, you know, He's a good um, supporter and, and a cheerleader. And, and I'll say things like, you know, I'm never going to get rich and famous doing these because they're not monumental. And he says, well, then do monumental still lifes, you know, do like washing machines and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> microwaves. And <laughs> so I guess I could do that. <laughs> um, someone in the in, online asked, will this recording be posted anywhere? And yes, it will. And if so, when will it be available for replay? If my Facebook Live is correctly working, I'm still not sure of that. Um, it should be available as soon as um, as soon as we're finished here. If not, um, it goes to our someone will edit it down for uh, use on YouTube, and then we'll have it there. So um, yeah, any last questions here from the audience? I'm going to make a little plug for myself. Um, sure. So, so my, you know, my photographs are represented, some of them by a gallery in New York. And 
and photographs are expensive. And, um, and sometimes when people come through my open studios, I'll have college students come through and, and talk to me. And I even last year had some college students who said, we really love your work and we want to buy one. And I was like, oh, they're so expensive. And, you know, and it's through the gallery. It's not like I can like, I'll give you a deal. Um, but I do with almost all of these, I've made blurb books, just like catalogs of the series. So the men, both of them, both of those projects have a blurb book and the dead pet toys and tech banatos. And, and those aren't terribly expensive and they're easy to get. And I make like a dollar if you buy one. So it's not like a big money making venture for me. It's really just more of a way that people who really, you know, like this work can, can get a book full of them if you really want to. So look at blurb and look me up. If that's really called the dead that's dead the dead website dead. blurb and you can buy you can buy that there okay yeah. terrific that's really great that's interesting to know for our artists here if they ever wanted to produce something like that too so that's great um wonderful all right well um i think that's about it thank you so much um big round of applause <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah. And so you can hopefully find this on the Gertz Gallery Facebook account. <laughs> if I got that correct. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. I really appreciate it. You did a terrific job and it's really wonderful getting to know you and having your artwork in our gallery. So thank you so much.